having me. Um, this is great. Beautiful. Thank you, Raquel. So Mike, good, good evening. So nice that you can join us tonight. Uh, my very first question would is, how did you get started? Uh, yeah, so um, I can go really far back or just a little far back. Uh, I, I, <laughs> so I, I uh, went to school at the Art Institute of Philadelphia. Uh, I was an animation major for the first few months. Um, and then I realized quickly that um, it, it wasn't for me at the time. That's what I thought. And then uh, I switched over to the graphic design program, um, which was focused on like multimedia. And um, I, I got proficient in Flash. That's how old I am. And um, just learning the basics of the programs like InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator, and Dreamweaver. That's how old I am as well. And uh, after that, I graduated, had some jobs at um, some local shops, went to a bigger agency. Um, and I wasn't really doing work that I, 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 I wanted to. It wasn't, it wasn't as conceptual as I, I felt that I, I was better at. Um, so during, after, after work and during like my night hours, I would just kind of pick away at things and concepts that I wanted to make and turn them into like mini, um, just mini projects. And it gave me a, a chance to kind of flex my muscles on that. And then uh, ended up putting a portfolio together of that type of work, which ended up getting me slightly better gigs. Um, and I moved out to Chicago, worked at an agency. Then I went to a really small shop and from there, um, I started getting cover inquiries and, um, you know, op-ed illustration inquiries. Um, some where I would bug the art directors, others where they would come to me or see something I'd done with my personal work online. And, um, and then from there, I just decided to go out on my own. And that was, gosh, I think about seven and a half, eight years ago. So I've been on my own since. And, um, moved from Chicago to Philadelphia, and now I'm in Richmond, Virginia, which is a cool little town. Yeah. And uh, right from here, my practice is just doing conceptual uh, work for publications, uh, as well as collage work and abstracted work. Raquel, can you put up the, uh, some of the images, uh, Mike's images? Um, yes, sure, let me, let me do that. Yeah, while, while Lori is, asking questions, it'd be great for people to see this amazing work. Um, Mike, as you were um, working on the side and developing your own ideas, right? You know, um, what uh, other designers, artists, um, sources were you looking at for inspiration and, and or what is what was inspire, what inspiring you during that moment, during those times? Uh, great question. Yeah, I. Um when I, I knew I wanted to get into the more, like more the illustration side of things. So I looked up to guys like uh, the heads of state. Um, Matt Dorfman was another one that I looked up to. Uh, and um, anything that was coming out of the New York Times at the time, like the book review covers, uh, Sunday review covers, it was just a chance to be introduced to someone new that would inspire me and um, you know, test how conceptual I could get with things or, um, yeah. So I, I'd say, and on the art side, you know, I looked up to like the simplicity of like John Baldessari's work and, um, you know, the craziness of Rauschenberg's work. Also Ed Ruska, like just being conceptual in nature, um, was really attractive. So I kind of, garnered influence there. And I'd say David Carson too, in some respect was, um, I, I found a lot of influence in at that time. And, and were you um, imitating what you were seeing or just analyzing what you were seeing? Like um, how were you figuring out your elements and principles or yeah, what um, media or you know, your aesthetic approach? Sure. Um, I mean, it would always start with, I just want to make that. Um, but then um, the more I would do it, the more I wanted to 
deviate from that. Uh, and then I started to realize what was important about the work. And it was always, it always came back to either their process or their conceptual abilities. Um, so I guess as I progressed, it went from copying and never showing because I, you know, I didn't feel like I had any ownership over it to um, using it as inspiration and then um, trying to figure out my own voice in it uh, or letting the concept lead where the execution went. Um, that was probably the latter part of the, you know, I guess my copying escapade. <laughs> uh, and then from, from there, I just, I just learned what was, what were good tactics and methods for getting to good work. And it typically always leads with, you know, know the piece you're making the work for, um, read it a few times if you have to, and try and surprise yourself with a concept that you wouldn't necessarily, um, wouldn't necessarily be like your first thought. Right, and, and um, you know, it's so interesting. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna ask you to define what you mean by conceptual work, right? Because it's a very interesting situation and um, we'll see if, if people need a little bit more um, uh, explanation. Uh, but of course, um, that has something to do with seeing and reading, right? You know, where um, you're letting uh, the viewer, the reader interpret it. You're not necessarily tying it up all together um, in, in an image. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I, would, I, would, I would say that's a huge part of what I try and achieve is like, um, letting you work for it and finding the meaning in it um, as opposed to just hitting you over the head with it. So I guess in that way, it's all conceptual, right? But in that way, it's abstract. So. That's great. Um, so, <clears throat> go ahead, Ed. So Mike, I have a question. So in most cases, you get these gigs from, you know, uh, a client and you team up with an art director and you talk about, you know, what, what the objective is. And um, when I look at it as a collector, I, I look at your work and I see it as art and I see it, you know, it's, I find it uh, exhilarating and entertaining, but from a, from a motivational point of view, um, is the, pr the primary motivation to inform, is it to influence or persuade, or is it, just to, you know, to entertain people's eyeballs, uh, or if it's sort of all of the above, you know, what is the, what's what's the deal with the art director? D does the art director allow you to make those kinds of judgments, or is it something that is um, a negotiation? I mean, you know, sure. is, it, is it is it propaganda or is it something else? Sure. Um... I think it's kind of all of the above. Um, sometimes an art director will hire me strictly for style. And I think that's just to, you know, draw attention to something or uh, give it something better than a Getty image. Um, and then other times I'll get handed a manuscript or um, a few working titles in a synopsis and I have to make an image out of that. Um, and the goal is always to make a piece that not only supports the article, but can stand on its own and you get a very similar story from it on without the words. Um, and that's always the, the practice. And I guess in that way, um, it helps, I guess, clarify the story or give it give it, uh, I guess, a little bit more meaning. Right. So propaganda has a, it, it sounds negative, but it's really, it's a, it's a kind of a neutral term. It's persuasion. Mm -hmm. And so do you see yourself in the persuasion business or are you someone who, you know, feels that you're primarily, you know, an artist, a designer, and it's the editorial content that's doing the, you know, the the initial persuasion. You're just amplifying that, right? Uh, I mean, I'm definitely just an, I'm an artist first, um, and you know, whatever is happening in the world tends to 
um, be what I have to work on or work with. Um, like the Trump years, it was just a lot of Trump imagery. Um, and after a while you start to say, well, I know that this piece is putting him in a negative light. And I know that's what this artwork is supporting. Um, but you can see how someone can use that artwork as a counter narrative or as almost like glorifying him as an individual. So it is a fine line between, you know, propaganda and um, just making artwork to support an article. Um, so I try and watch out for that. And um, these days I'm trying to make work that's a little bit more evergreen. Uh, you have to do a little bit more digging to, to get the concept and less, uh, I guess, less literal. If we have time, it would be great, uh, Laura, it would be great uh, to give Mike an opportunity to go through some of those images and kind of talk about, you know, what they are, where they came from, what the article was, that'd be wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Ed. I, um, so Mike, uh, we have a question from um, our guests tonight, right, our audience, uh, and they're interested oh. in knowing more about your process. Could you, um, I think now might be a really good time to talk about that. Cool. Um, yeah, so every, every project starts the same, um, a, a sketchbook, a lot of reading, sketching, list making, trying to get at what the heart of the piece is and what it's supposed to feel like, like tone is very important. Uh, is it a serious piece? Is it lighthearted? Um, is it a tearjerker? What, what emotions are, is it supposed to draw from the, the reader? Um, and then from there, I, I typically will start almost everything by hand. Not, not be, that, that doesn't mean that it's gonna have to come out as an analog collage in the end necessarily. I just find comping to be quicker and there's more hand to, to eye to brain thing that happens with me um, where I can put pieces together and make a, a bunch of comps quickly and move fast. Um, and so I'll typically start there and um, depending on where the concept leads me, it might take a U-turn and it's like, oh, well, this is all, this all needs to be digital now, or um, actually analog's perfect for this, or uh, this type of imagery is working really well or, or not. Um, so I, I generally just let whatever's in the sketchbook lead the way and then um, figure out the rest as I go. Sometimes I hobble through it and sometimes it comes really quick. So. And, and in, the, in your process, when do you start sharing this work with your the art director, whoever's going to sign off on it. Yeah, so it depends on the project. Um, if if it's an art director that I know and have worked with for a long time, you know, I'll, I'll be as vulnerable as it can be and show things in, in working states. Uh, other times, um, some art directors need things in a more final state. Um, it's typically when they have to go and show the client something. If it's just uh, an, an art director of I have no problem showing pencils sometimes, um, even though it's it's typically they come from me for some sort of collage, um, or just like kind of sometimes I've Frankenstein'd old works of mine together in an, in a quick concept. Anything to just if it if it looks like oh you can you can gain what he's trying to do here from this. If it hits that mark, then I'll send it. If it's still a little murky. Um, I'll refine it slightly, but it's not a perfect process. We another question from you know the audience asking a lot about the imagery that you're the photographic imagery. Uh, how do you manage copyright? And you know how how are you? What is your um, yeah? What's your strategy for generating that? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, so there's a ton of resources that are um, open source or public domain. And I usually searching around on, on those or really old out of print magazines. Sometimes I'm allowed to use that stuff. Other times some publications are more strict with that. Um, and for my personal work, it's every, anything is fair game as long as I turn it into a different image. Um, that's my role. If you can kind of tell where it came from, or it's it's too 
too much just a representation of the original image, then um, then it, it won't work in my personal work because I want full ownership. And other times, if it's a piece about a particular individual or individuals, um, I'll be supplied the imagery. Um, and sometimes you get a cool subject matter like Citizen Kane and you get to work with all these great archival photos. And that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And Mike, could you elaborate? Oh, oh yes. Um, yes. I, Raquel, go I, ahead. I was gonna suggest that um, since Mike is talking about process that I, I would like to ask him to talk a little bit about this image, um, this two, uh, are uh, pieces of art um, about O.J. Simpson. We, we talked a little bit previously. Um, we talked about it and I really would like to hear you uh, talking about your process. Great, yeah. Um, so again, it always starts with sketches. Um, you know, I, I feel like when you have such a recognizable figure like O.J. Simpson, you can do these types of things. So, you know, this piece was about, um, how O.J. Simpson was like pontificating on Twitter about uh, jury selection out of all things. And um, the writer just wrote it in this way that like, it's just absurd that he was talking about jury selection um, being, you know, his infamous case. Anyway, so it was a kind of a lighthearted, absurd piece. And I wanted it to feel, I wanted there to be elements of you know, I guess wacky, but you know, not wacky is the wrong word, but just not taking itself too serious. Um, and I found these like really great old images of um, people in the courthouse and, it's, and then it's cutting up OJ's face and then it's this old um, leather chair it was actually from a C CSA image. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of creating this these dual images of him was a little jarring, like your eyes trying to put pieces of the one with the other. And there's something really interesting about that playfulness. And yes, yeah. yes. I think that it's really uh, interesting that it works well as a, a series. It's like you keep going back and forth. Was it published as um, one piece or was published like in two different pages? How was it this one used? Yeah, so um, this is for uh, New York Times Magazine Screenland section. And it's like a very long panel that they run across the spread. So I actually prefer to, it, it, there, there's more to this piece. It was these two, and then there was a hand that I, like with a glove, um, which was from his infamous case. And I mm -hmm. just kind of cut that up in a similar way. Uh, and I try and treat it like a triptych or like four panel. Um, and that way I, I get nice movement across the illustration um, because it is rather long in dimension, so. Yeah, it is interesting that you mentioned um, it is a 2D static piece, but you, there is a lot of movement because as you said, your the eye, our eyes, the readers, we keep going back and forth uh, on both images. So it's a really amazing job. Oh yeah, and one more thing on this. It was about uh, jury selection being uh, mostly like white folks, the, hence the white dots in the chairs, so. Oh, yeah. Wow, That's interesting, great. yeah. <laughs> um, that is great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have uh, other questions from, from the audience that it would be interesting to, to share with you. Um, we have a lot of questions. So um, here, you talked a little bit about your, your process already, but uh, Karish is asking, at what point did you find collage as the medium for you? What led you to it? What were your explorations with media before this point? And uh, also she's asking if you believe collage is a medium for for you that it will evolve into something else as you go along. And so there are multiple questions, but if you could yeah, comment on that. And well, just to add, uh, Mike, add one more, it would be how, how is your personal work might have something to do with this too. You could talk about that, great. Great, uh, yeah. Um, 
that's a good point because it's that's exactly what it is um so when i first started dabbling as an illustrator it was a lot of drawing and a lot of trying to find a style um and you know trying to get at some sort of i don't know like mixture of imagery that got to a got a point across but then you know discovering guys like heads of state and um matt dorfman it really just kind of opened my eyes to the possibility of uh image making not so not so tied to like a specific aesthetic or style but more or less like doing whatever the concept doing whatever is right for the concept so that's that kind of led me into collage because um, I felt there was a contemporary feeling to getting the point across with as little elements as possible. I really liked that practice. And it's, you know, I have, I have roots in graphic design, not in fine art. Um, so collage was playing with scale, composition, color, um, introduction of typography in some sense, um, making something out of an image. So using restraint um so there are all these things that i from my past that i think collage made sense um i also had a stint a few years where i was doing a lot of screen printing and just like reproducing imagery um accidents that happen and you're like oh this is this is cooler than what my original intent was um so that just constantly playing and constantly being curious about this just making art um always informs where i'm going next right like i don't know where i'll end up um in a year or two or five but i'll just let my practicing and making personal work kind of guide my interests as i grow as an artist i guess Mike, I want to follow up here because there's several people, several pe in several places, people are asking about um, your art, art design historical sources, Dada, constructivism, Hartfeld, you know, Hannah Hacha, you know, a lot of, lot of sources here. And um, I, uh, I was uh, surprised by your answer on Sunday when we first met and started talking about this. So. Um, yeah, uh, the fact that obviously people are noticing or seeing um historical works in your work uh could you comment on that please oh well, i mean one it, that's it's very flattering um but i'm definitely not like a historian on dada i i you know i i, I the, the farthest back i like to go is like ed ruska and um john baldessari's work like i i feel like that generation of artists and you know robert rauschenberg um just they, I'm trying to, I guess, pick up that and see where else it goes and how does it apply? How is it applicable to our culture and our generation? And where, where else can it go? Like, how can I um, transform that into whatever, whatever would be new? That's kind of where I keep my head, yeah. But it's flattering to hear that there's references made to that. Mike, um, another interesting story um, you told us was about this series here with the this women. So could you tell us um, how was the process of creating this uh, series? Yeah, um, so the photographs were taken of Sudanese women um, in a refugee camp by this amazing photographer, Giles Dooley. Um, and he was working on a series where he was asking artists to reinterpret his work um, via collage, via painting, what have you. Um, and so I was just, I was really, it, it was astonishing to hear the stories of these women and kind of hardships that they endured um, under a civil war and uh, corruption and just terrible things. And the fact that they were living in a refugee camp when these photos were taken and they were 
um, getting together and doing their hair and in traditional styles that they weren't allowed to wear for many years because of um, conflict in in their where they were living. And um, so I really just wanted to show the kind of emotional pains that they endured, but I wanted to keep it um, still beautiful and just not get in the way too much in this in this one. Uh, really just wanted to show these women as they are and then show these obstructions as these things that they're kind of seeing through, um, but have no doubt endured. Um, then there's parts that can be tied back to the camp that they're staying in. Um, there's military manual things in there. Um, and yeah, I, they're very powerful and near and dear to my heart, these ones, so. Yes, they are gorgeous. The, yeah, yeah the, the photographs are really uh, beautiful. They're so expressive and, and, and the collage highlights the, you know, the, them and these women in a very elegant and very, um, it makes them uh, just pop up from, like from the from the page and be the center of this um, this pieces. There's really Great. really really that gorgeous. That was the goal. Yeah, that was yeah, the goal. They're really and these gorgeous. are these are all analog as well. So this is all done by hand. Um, yeah, and then I just scan them. And the and this this ones uh, how big are they? These. Uh, I'd say 12 by 18. Mm -hmm. And this is usually the size Something that around you... there. I don't, that's not exact, but <laughs> yeah. Mounted. Do you, do you work around this size like a lot? Because um, there are larger, uh, there's, um, there are larger pieces at the end that I want to share with the audience. Um, yeah. That, uh... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I work with found materials a lot. So sometimes I can restrict your, the sizes of the pieces you build. Um, but then in the, uh, in the example you have up, um, these were, these are five foot by seven foot pieces and they were done for a co-working space in Dallas. Um, and it's in a neighborhood called Deep Ellum. So we tried to uh, create collages that represent represented the kind of uh, interesting past of that area in Dallas. Um, and the way this went down was we, I did small scale collages um, with elements that I had found. And then um, I got some of those, those images screen printed. Some of them were uh, printed on like a cliche printer. So um, just like dot, almost like Xeroxing in a way. And some were hand painted, like the numbers and the letter forms you see on both of these were all hand painted. Um, and then I just took the plan from the smaller collage and started pasting these on larger boards that I had custom made by a guy here in town. Wow. They are, um, it's, a, it's really interesting this picture with the with the chair because you can you can really have a sense of yeah. scale. Uh, do you do you like do you have a preference between like working with um, pieces like this big or a small, or a smaller size? I mean, working large is always fun um, and it's always um, rewarding because it kind of engulfs you and these pieces become. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know how to explain it other than there's something about scale that does it for me. Um, so I do, I did enjoy working on these at this scale. And I think, um, you know, the plan here in my studio is to do more of these, um, but be less rigorous about the planning process. So committing to a set of images, printing those images large scale, and then working with what I have and to make something out of it instead of having a plan before going in. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what that'll do is it'll end up causing more repetition and more um, 
just visual cues that tie things together and it won't be so individual each piece. Yeah, Mike, yeah. there's a question. Um, Maria asks about the, I guess, the ordering or the similarity, right, that you're working with, you started to talk about. Um, Maria talk, sees geometry in the work. Um, and she's asking, where does that influence or preference come from? Interesting. Um, that one I really don't have an answer for. Uh, I guess I just, it kind of levels it off for me. Um, you know, or if I do use organic shapes, you'll, you'll also see that they're very um, considered and I'll do a bunch of cutting and I'll get to one shape and I'll just be obsessed with that shape as opposed to having a bunch of shapes. So maybe there's something in that uh, restraint and editing that makes geometry make sense for me. I don't know. Yeah, I, just, I guess I just enjoy the way it looks when it's uh, breaking up a composition or a, a photo or something a little bit more organic. Raquel, there's a question up here from um, Radams uh, Cordero, probably didn't pronounce the first name correctly, uh, but a good question, really great question. What are you working on now next? What's next for you? Um, so in terms of assignments or? Um, yeah, yeah. In, sure, uh, yeah, right now I'm um, working on a cover for a magazine, um, Pentagram. I'm working with an art director named Matt Willie. He's got a publication coming out called Inc, I-N-Q-U-E. Um, and it comes out once a year and um, then it, it ends at 10 years. So it has an end, a shelf life already, which is cool. Um, and it's really interesting written pieces. Uh, it's all about art and culture and um, no advertisers, which allow them to have a lot of creative freedom, which is great. Um, I got a book jacket manuscript that I'm reading that I can't say the title of, uh, kick off with New York Times about something on Thursday. And um, I'm wrapping up some work for the Citizen Kane um, release for a Criterion Collection. Cool. Um, yeah. there is, again, we, we're having questions about your process and this, um, Allison asks a really good one, which is, um, what is the most frustrating part about your process, about the process for you? And then how do you get yourself unstuck? Uh, yeah, no, um, imposter syndrome uh, is something I deal with quite a lot. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know why, maybe it's just how I'm made up. I never, never feel quite content uh, or comfortable. Um, Sometimes it's, if, if you didn't know me, you'd be like, well, I don't know if you are happy, <laughs> but I am promise. Uh, I, I, I just tend to, uh, yeah, I just, I, imposter syndrome is a big thing for me, if I'm being honest. And the other thing is uh, you have to be very vulnerable when you're an artist and you're doing work for publications or brands um, and that you have to show them work and you don't, nobody really knows what they're looking for. You can have a brief and you can have um, a, a great manuscript and a great understanding. And the next thing you know, this thing out of left field just works better and you, there's no real explanation. And I think you have to get comfortable with showing those works. Um, for a long time, I would always ask the question like, well, what are they looking for? What are they looking for? And then once I let that go down and I said, you know, what, what am I looking for? Or this is interesting, even though it's, it's not exactly what we had intended. Um, I think having the confidence to just show that stuff, um, nine times out of 10, it's usually the stuff that gets through and then everyone's excited. You're excited to make it because it's new to you and um, the client's excited because it's gonna help them. Um, whatever their project is and uh and you grow as an artist so yeah i guess getting comfortable with being vulnerable and um squashing um, imposter syndrome would be the most frustrating parts of what i do it's yeah that's good to hear because it makes you human right <laughs> oh yeah, yeah very much so. um mike tim carpenter has a great question 
about your workspace. So um, the question is, are you in your studio right now? And um, how, is, how important is your space to your work? Um, the final part of the question is funny. Are you a collector hoarder like many collage artists? <laughs> uh Yes, this is my studio that you see. This is the front of the studio, which is more um, pretty, more designed. Um, in the back studio, you kind of see the door here that's dark over my shoulder. That's where the hoarding and crazy messes um, that, I, that I need and thrive on. Uh, I've found that the reason I think collage artists have a bunch of stuff on the table and around them is there's a lot of happenstance that can happen when you're maybe working on this project and you cut things up and it's not quite working for what you're trying to do with that project. And you kind of plop it down over to the left and there's other images over there that you were doing for something else. And then there's something that kind of happens and you're like, oh, and you just kind of, it's almost like you could put a collage together in two seconds and it's perfect. And you're like, and you just kind of leave it and you put it off to the side until you're done with your project. Um, so I, I rely on that a lot too now. Um, and so yeah, being a mess is good and, and hoarding. I, I have a, a ton of different magazines that are out of print, out of circulation. And uh, I'm always trying to find new, more obscure type things where I can use images and have fun. And where do you usually find your, where, where are your findings like uh, uh, more often? Um, you know, it's funny. It can be anything really. Like sometimes I'll get hung up on just really bad flyers that I see and it's not archival or, or old or sometimes I'll get like right now, and this isn't going to make any sense at all, but I am researching the um, filtration systems for pools. And um, there's something in it that I, I'm intrigued by. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but I'm just saying, I think you, I'm always, I always try and I'm, I always have an eye out for something, I guess would be my answer. Um, sometimes like eBay is a good source if you're looking to buy like old magazines and stuff um, or just like going to flea markets um, or bookshops. Um, that kind of thing, you can find a lot of really good resources and that's typically where I find the bulk of what I have. Mm -hmm. So would you say that it's more common that you, once you have an, like a job that you're gonna go, go for, you're gonna try to find something specific or uh, it's more common that you collect a bunch of images and when you have a specific job, you, you work through your collection? Uh, a mixture of both, depending on the project. Um, you know, sometimes if I if I'm on an assignment that's really fast, I'll I'll write a list based on the um, the writing, the words, and then I'll just research those images. What what are images attached to these words? And I'll just as an exercise put them together really fast and see. Sometimes I'll get lucky and it'll work. Um, other times it's like, oh, well, you know what? This kind of looks like it could be anything. It doesn't have to be from this era. It doesn't have to be this specific image. It could be um, an abstraction of it or it can be represented in this way or um, anyway. Yeah, so whatever gets the juices flowing first, I guess would be my answer to that. Mike, I have a, I have a if I can uh, jump back in again for a second. Um, uh, someone mentioned the, the the amount of movement you have in your the collages, uh, and I wonder since you started in animation, you've come all this distance in putting different uh, found objects and 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 your illustrations together. Uh, do you see a way back to 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 moving pictures? You know, to animation. Pixelation, do you see, uh, do you have an appetite to, to apply what you've learned as a, as, a, as a designer and a illustrator to, you know, invent or create a new form of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, moving yeah. uh, images? 
Well, I mean, it's a great question. Um, I, the fact that there's movement seen in my static collages, I don't, I can't really talk to whether that ties back to uh, my very, very short stint in animation, but I definitely have an interest in animation. And um, I think as a medium, it's definitely um, a good, a good thing to have and know. Um, so I maybe, maybe I will do more of that. I've, I've definitely handed my work over to animators and have, have had it animated. Um, but I would also imagine that it would change my process up quite a bit because I don't think if something is static and it looks like there's movement and it doesn't necessarily translate to what does it look good if, if it's moving, right? Um, so it's a, I think it's a field onto, into its own and uh, onto its own and it's um, a difficult field. So uh, maybe if I'm looking to completely switch it up, I'll, I'll look into it. But yeah, my remedial animation skills probably wouldn't, wouldn't do anything, anything but that's worth showing to the world. <laughs> right now, currently. Raquel, I wanna, um, the last uh, several questions um, submitted are interesting. And uh, Javier, Jim and Karish uh, are talking more about, um, you know, your editorial work. It's very, you know, um, emotionally heavy. Um, how do you, does it take a toll on you? How do you step back from it? You know, leave it at the end of your working day. Um, also definitely interested in um, hearing more, maybe what you have to say about art direction. Um, and do you struggle with your own political point of view when you're asked to editor uh, editorialize things that you might not agree with? Uh, all great questions. Um, yes, you know, sometimes, especially during like um, when Trump was first elected, it was personally, it was really tough for me. Um, and then getting a lot of assignments about him and having to stare at his face. Definitely got these moments of just like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, not, not that it wasn't, the, the assignment was important and I felt the gravity of it. And I was, I was grateful to be a part of the process. Um, but after a while, you, you, you just, yeah, I guess you get like a PTSD type thing going on. And I always felt for the people that work at the New York Times where it's like day in and day out, they have to, you know, um, and, and they probably get more numb to it maybe. Um, but yeah, I definitely am an emotional person and it was something, especially when coronavirus thing hit, it's, and you're being asked to make art about it. You're like, well, you know, for me, I was like, is it, can I? Like, I don't know how much time I can spend with this. Um, so I know that was the first question. And the second question, um, just stepping away or, you know, talking more about art direction and oh, yeah. then um, stepping away. How do you, where, I guess maybe how do you relax? How do you mm -hmm. keep fresh? How do you yeah. keep away from burnout? Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So like art direction, um, you know, my favorite art directors, uh, I mean, they're, they're all great in their own respects, wherever they are, are working. And if I, um, but, but the best assignments I would say are the ones that are a little bit more open-ended. Um, there's no like, hey, here's a smattering of your work we think could work for this. Um, I'm happy to do those assignments, but typically it, it's hard for me to think outside the box when I'm, I've already been shown the box um, kind of thing. Um, so I definitely like a more open brief and when it's not, there's nothing figured out. Um, and stepping away, um, you know, I, I, I like to make art with my son. Um, he's six years old and I get a lot of inspiration from that, seeing this, you know, just the creative flow that comes from a little kid is, is, is great. And um, I, I, basically right now, all my free time is with him. So uh, him and my wife, so I, that's, we we'll usually go on like hikes or do something on the weekends that's not focused on graphic design or illustration at all. Um, I'm not, not a perfect world. Sometimes it bleeds over. Uh, I, I typically try and um, work late nights during the week so I can have the weekends off. And um, sometimes I'll go on a bike ride and run if I really need to clear my head. And that's, yeah, that's how I usually step away. 
but you have to step away. That's a, it's an important part. I don't, I don't agree with um, constantly working and churning. And I think that's, you're never gonna, if you're not happy doing it, it's probably because you're just burnt out and you're doing too much of it, so. We do have a question about your bucket list. So commission, <laughs> venues, publications. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, from Andrew. Okay. Yeah. Um, bucket list. Uh, I guess a, a big one would be to just start making work without clients. Like, um, just I I'm developing my own narratives and points of view on the world and things, and um, I, I would like to just make work a, a bunch of it, and maybe it shows up in a gallery or maybe. It, I don't know. I don't know what the end goal for that would be, but that and um, I guess I would always like to, you know, put graphics on an airplane. That would be interesting mm. to have your or something oh. that goes to space. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe they're the same thing. Maybe I'll just send something to space on my own. There you go. I love that. That's the right <laughs> attitude. <laughs> um, we have a question from Amanda Perez that I I think is also. Uh, very interesting. It's, are you ever given material um, or images that you should incorporate in your work? Yes, um, much like the Giles Dooley piece, um, those images were supplied. And, um, you know, any anytime it's, a, it's about a specific individual and they have an archive of photos of this individual or thing or place in time, um, the art directors or photo editors will typically supply me with um, what they have. Sometimes it's a it's a it's an open-ended thing. Like I'll I'll go and find them and see if we can use them. Um, so we uh, a good uh, story on that is for Screenland, we were working on a piece. It was about the videos of Heart Island where they were unfortunately burying uh, a lot of the deceased from COVID-19 in New York. Um, and it's got a long history. They, they were burying AIDS patients there a long time ago. And I found these really great photos, um, blanking on the photographer's name, um, but she took them during the AIDS epidemic and when they were doing a lot of burials on the island. And it was really tough to get photos of the island. There wasn't a lot available. Um, so we reached out to her and were able to access some of her archival photos for the illustration and you know things like that where it's a little bit more legwork and everybody's on a timeline crunch um, but you know if, if the idea is right we all try and make it work um, interesting so th there is um, collaboration um, mm -hmm. of course right always yeah yeah uh, Mike, I'd like to go back uh, to your personal, um, and we only have a few minutes left. But okay. We have some questions uh, that we can, we can go a little bit um, further after eight, if that's okay with you. But uh, one question that I wanted to ask you is about this um, series here. Uh, and I know it's a personal work. So do you see it uh, being enlarged? Yeah. Okay. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about this uh, series? Um, well, first off, sorry if I maybe put them in the wrong folders, but these were not personal works. Oh, um, uh, okay. These were, but which, <laughs> I'm glad that you went there. I, I'm, it's flattering that you felt that these could be personal works because um, I do as well. Um, but these were made, uh, I don't know if you remember, also a Screenland piece here. They were made, um, I don't know if you remember the monoliths that were showing up everywhere. Mm -hmm. They were like those shiny objects. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of like mystery around it, um, like who was doing it and what. And so, and, and that shape was just, it was just perfect. Um, and so on the right, I did a cutout shape of the monolith, my interpretation of it. Um, and then underneath it, um, is a uh, kind of invert of an image of a desert land. Um, and it's kind of like kaleidoscoping in a way. So it's kind of weird. 
And then to the left, I did the, you know, kind of repetitive image in the background mirroring one another. And then that triangle in the middle is actually what the monolith looked like from an aerial view. So, mm. but wow. I don't have to tell you any of that. And mm -hmm. you're, you can probably get a tone in a sense that it's kind of otherworldly, right? So, you know, so you know what I, what I read, like, I, is this, I don't remember if this is a three series of three pieces, three pieces, right? Um, yes. So, but seeing this two, the way they are presented here, I kind of see the, like the, this the symbol of the feminine because of the triangle mm -hmm. uh and the masculine so and i'm you know masculine <laughs> so it's funny the way it landed here um and it's amazing how you're not gonna read it um you know each each reader is gonna read it the way uh you know he she uh, or they want so and i love that and i try yeah. i aim for that yeah so great yes <laughs> thank you mike <laughs> um so we have time, I think, for maybe, you wanna do like two more questions? Yeah, whatever, it's fine. Um, awesome, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so uh, Chris Von Bursk, um, are you able to shed any light on the financial aspect of what you do? Um, and here's very like a specific question about how much you charge. And I'm, I'm not sure you're mm -hmm. going to be comfortable talking about that, but, but maybe sharing what's your process for, you know, defining your, uh, the price or how many you charge, like based on the, how many hours or how challenging it is to find resources. Yeah. So it, it's all of the above. Some jobs pay very little, um, and some jobs for like ad agencies or bigger brands, they have a bigger budget. Um, and things are usually priced by project because pricing, I mean, pricing by hour, I guess is a good baseline for you to figure out what to charge, right? Um, but if I were to be honest about hours with clients, I don't know how many would hire me on the price tag that they would see because there's a lot of hours that go into what I do um, and I'm happy to get a fair amount of money for um, doing this type of work um, and in terms of pricing uh, like I said project-based sometimes there's a rep involved if the agency um, so chooses to go through one um, uh, but I would say editorial work is low paying so um, I would say if I'm doing a scale, uh, editorial can be rather low paying. And then you get into a working with specific brands and individuals, it pays a little better. And then ad agencies, campaigns, things like that pay great. Um, and then every once in a while you get lucky and you get a commission to do actual pieces at five foot by seven foot by a, a real estate company that pays great as well. So the money comes in from a lot of different areas. And I think as an artist, you need to do that in order to survive, um, unfortunately. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know what it must have been like for those guys back in the day that were just doing editorial all the time and um, living comfortably. So um, mixing it up is kind of a, a necessity. Um, I don't know if that answers the question really, but the lowest you can get paid, I think is $300. And sometimes you can get paid up to like 90,000, 95,000 if you get a really good agent and a really good um, gig. So that would be a range. It's a that's big range. Yeah, it's <laughs> a big range. <laughs> and that's, I, I guess that answers. Um, and um, Lori and Ed, would you like to, to ask something else? Um, from your side. Sorry. Oh, I, I have one more and it has to do with who owns the copyright. Like oh. um, that could be very helpful. And I'm thinking about Ed, you know, you're a collector and I'm thinking about and or and or people starting to collect you, right? So practical and then aspiration. Sure. Um, so if you do something for an editorial piece, the copyright or the ownership that they have over it is just while it's in circulation. Um, and then it's rights 
you, they never have the rights. They they own it for it's like a rights managed, I guess, type deal. Um, and then you know, if you get into working with the guys at and and, and women at like Apple and um, bigger brands like that, their contracts are definitely more. They want to own things outright because they have such a big network of people that might use that artwork for certain things. Um, and it might be over a certain period of time, but typically it's like five years ownership. They would have ownership over the artwork. Um, and that's why I, I tell illustrators to um, get used to pricing your work by like ownership. So just to give an example, this illustration will cost a thousand dollars. If you want to own it for a year, there's a 25% mark on that. So 25% of the thousand dollars on top of that thousand dollars and then 50 and then outright ownership is hundred percent. So it costs thousand dollars for the illustration, but if you want to own it outright, you need to pay me $2,000. Um, a lot of big companies want to do a buyout and you can make, more money on your illustrations um, if just by negotiating your contracts, right? Thank you. Very, very good. Yeah, in terms I, of like I collecting, I, I think Ed and a few other people maybe want something from me. Um, mm -hmm. Not a ton. I'm willing, I'm willing to walk from Baltimore to Richmond to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, think, I think you work as a, as a collector, not as a, a practitioner. I think your work is highly collectible on a number of different levels. First of all, it is very contemporary and it, it is not a, uh, you know, an effort. It's not a, you know, an effort to create a vintage image. Although I'm not the only one who sees, you know, central Europe between the wars, whether, whether you see it or not, uh, your choice of colors, that kind of orange is red and black and, taking a look at what Mahali Naj was doing and what uh, Piet's Vart was doing in the Netherlands. And uh, someone mentioned John Hartfield. I mean, there are the choices that they made, interestingly enough, and the choices that you make, even if they're not really li literally connect connected, I think they're very interesting and they're very similar, but they may be that they were the right choices. And so someone made it 80 years ago and you're making those choices now without attempting to capture some kind of Bauhaus, you know, imagery. It's just, it's a very organic process, but. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, but but it's interesting that when you mention your, the, the people and the, the, the artists and the designers that you look to for inspiration, that none of the people that I just mentioned show up on that, on that A-list. But, but there is so much similarity and it, it, it's an, I, I don't know if that's a question or it's just, it's something to ponder that are we living through a, a period that necessitates a kind of art, a kind of movement in art, a kind of a cross between commercial and, 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 and more pure uh, fine art. Um, and we may be reliving it in, a, in an artistic sense without the intention of reliving it. So I don't know how you feel. Yeah, maybe. No, I, I, I tend to agree. I don't, um, I, I don't know if I care so much if it's fine art or commercial art, as long as it's like effective and just kind of draws me in. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, guess, I guess I just let things inspire me and then I use my own. My, my intuition and eye to fuss over details long enough till it looks good or looks new. I don't, good is a bad word. Like I don't really, the older I get, the more I really don't care about it pleasing my aesthetics, like the, the, the taste I have in certain aesthetic things uh, and more so just surprising me and feeling like I kind of stumbled onto something. Um, that's where I try and keep my head. And I think that maybe I'll, I'll progress. I'll progress to something different than what I'm doing now in just a year. I don't know. I like that open-endedness. Yeah. 
Yes, I agree. Um, I want to thank you so much, Mike. We, um, we're going to wrap up now, yeah. but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for this opportunity to, you know, to talk, to share with, with us your process and your thoughts about your work. And thank you, Ed, for making the connection between, um, you know, us and, and SODA and AAGA Baltimore. Thank you, Lori, so much for co-hosting this event. Uh, thank you all for attending this, uh, yes, for the participants. You. Thank you, thank you. And Mike, yeah. uh, do you want to say a, a few words and, you know, uh, before we, we all leave? Yeah, I'm extremely flattered that you all thought of me for this. And um, I'm glad everybody had such great, thoughtful questions. Um, and hopefully I didn't, you know, stammer on too long. And uh, yeah, thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. 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 Thank